Retina Rounds, episode number 142, ERM Peeling Basics. In today's video, we'll discuss preoperative and intraoperative considerations for epiretinal membrane peeling. This case is presented by Dr. Bertan Chakir, who performed this case as a first-year vitreoretinal fellow under the supervision of attending Dr. Theodore Lang. It nicely illustrates good fundamental techniques for ERM peeling. Let's check it out at the end of the case, we'll look at OCT biomarkers for ERMs that can help you in surgical planning. So this is a 50-year-old pseudophagic patient with a PVD and an idiopathic epiretinal membrane. On the OCT, you can see the hyperreflective line on top of the macula which represents the ERM. Two things I think are important to notice on this OCT. First, overlying the fovea, we see inner retinal layers that are extending over an elongated outer nuclear layer. This is highlighted by the red arrow. These are of course abnormal since we shouldn't see inner nuclear or inner plexiform layers overlying the outer nuclear, at, nuclear layer at the fovea, and this is termed ectopic inner foveal layers. The other finding is that there's disorganization of the inner, uh, inner layers of the retina, most likely due to chronic tractional forces. So these findings make this a stage 4 ERM, which carries with it a higher likelihood of poor vision at baseline and possibly poor visual prognosis than lower stage ERMs. Now at the end of the case, we'll review in more detail the staging of ERMs and other OCT biomarkers to be aware of. Okay, let's take a look at the case. You can see here that uh, trocars are uh, first being placed. Uh, this is a three-port pars plane of vitrectomy. You can see that the patient uh, here is pseudophagic. And uh, once those uh, trocars are, are put in place, Dr. Chuck here is going to introduce the light pipe and the vitreous cutter to perform a core vitrectomy. Now you'll remember that this patient already has a PVD, although triamcinolone will be used later on just to confirm uh, the presence of a PVD. Now for, this, uh, for the sake of time during this surgery, we're gonna skip over the peripheral shave, but it is important to perform a good peripheral shave and to perform a uh, careful scleral depressed examination of the periphery since um, uh, uh, pre-existing retinal breaks or even uh, breaks, intraoperative breaks can uh, sometimes be identified and should be treated. Now you can see that some uh, dilute tramcinolone has been placed over the uh, posterior pole and using a high magnification contact lens, Dr. Chakir is gently elevating this epiretinal membrane up from the retinal surface. And you can see that uh, it is uh, somewhat adherent uh, to uh, the superior area of the fovea. And as he's pulling on it, it looks like uh, the ERM is shearing and he's wanting to peel this ideally as one, uh, one continuous or one large sheet. And so he's going to go ahead and try in a different area uh, to uh, propagate the peeling of this ERM. You'll see here that he's going in a circumferential manner uh, and um, not uh, peeling directly over the fovea to begin with, but rather extending this ERM peeling circumferentially and then saving the fovea for a later time. Uh, and a couple of things that I think are important to note here one is you can see that Dr. Chakir has really steady uh, uh, hand control. So very, very nice and precise movements. You can see he's moving carefully, slowly, maintaining a view not only of the ERM uh, and uh, the underlying retina as he's peeling. So he's looking at the dynamics of how the underlying retina is behaving, but he's also looking at um, the, uh, the behavior of the ERM to make sure that it doesn't shear. And he's also looking at his uh, ERM for his ILM forceps because as he's peeling, he wants to be sure uh, not to um, uh, not to inadvertently hit those forceps against the inner surface of the retina. And so here, there's a combination of pulling up to release the adhesions of the ERM from the underlying macula, and then also peeling uh, sort of flatly tangentially uh, over the surface of the retina to extend the peeling. So now you can see he has a broader edge of this ERM and he's now peeling this so that the, uh, the extent of the peel is extending now uh, over the fovea. And it's important to look at the fovea as this is being done because excessive traction over the fovea could potentially create uh, a, a, a macular hole. So now uh, he's noticing that the ERM appears to be held up superiorly and so he's lifted up that part of the ERM and now again, very carefully uh, with continuous uh, force here, he's extending out the peel in a circumferential pattern, re-grabbing where it's necessary uh, to ensure that this membrane comes off in one sheet. Now, if it does uh, end up shearing, that's not a problem. The edge of the residual edge of the ERM can be re-grasped. 
However, uh, this is a really nice uh, technique here that Dr. Chakir is doing under the supervision of his attending, Dr. Leng, uh, to uh, try to get this ERM completely peeled uh, over the macular surface uh, and doing so in a way that's minimally traumatic to the underlying retina. So you can see here that the, uh, the fovea has certainly been cleared, the ERM peeling has been extended almost to the superior and inferior arcades, and now you see that that, uh, that ERM has, has been removed. So here's the patient at post-operative week one, and you can see already a normalization of the foveal contour and resolution of the ectopic inner foveal layers. Now the foveal outer nuclear layer still looks to be elongated, but it's early in this patient's post-operative course, and there's certainly more opportunity for anatomic normalization in the coming months. Uh, notably, this patient's vision has already improved to 2040, and the patient's metamorphopsia has improved as well. So here are some points for discussion. Uh, the first is how we decide whether or not to operate on an epiretinal membrane, and the surgeon should take into account multiple factors. Certainly the severity of visual symptoms, including blurred vision and metamorphopsia, need to be accounted for, especially with respect to how much these symptoms are actually interfering with the patient's day-to-day -day life. And also the uh, patient's symptoms should be correlated with the degree of anatomic findings. If, the, if there is a disconnect between the anatomic findings on OCT or fundoscopy and the patient's symptoms and other causes of, uh, of uh, vision decline should be, uh, should, be, um, should be investigated. Now trends over time can also be helpful to determine the appropriate time uh, to intervene surgically. And that applies too to OCT findings, which can evolve over time. And this article by Andrea Govetto and colleagues from the AJO in 2017, a new staging system for epiretinal membranes was presented. And we'll go over that right now. A stage one ERM shown at the top demonstrates a normal foveal contour, normal inner and outer retinal layers, and no ectopic layers over the fovea. And what I mean by that is you can see that at the fovea, we see the outer nuclear layer without overlying inner layers, like the inner nuclear layer or the inner plexiform layer. And that's the normal anatomy, of course. But in the later stage ERMs, which we'll get to, you can start seeing some of these ectopic layers growing over, uh, the, uh, over the fovea. Now the next image below that is a stage two ERM where we see flattening of the foveal pit, but still well-defined retinal layers and no ectopic inner foveal layers. You can see elongation of the outer nuclear layer, which is highlighted here by the red star. The image below that is a stage three ERM, uh, which is where we can start to see ectopic inner foveal layers, uh, but the retinal layers themselves are still well-defined. And so you can see in this OCT, uh, we see that there are ectopic inner foveal layers overlying uh, the, the fovea, and those are highlighted by the yellow star. And the bottom image is a stage four ERM where we now also see disorganization of the inner layers of the retina. And this is very similar to the ERM that was presented uh, in, in today's video. So why do we care about these OCT biomarkers? Well, this, the higher the stage of the ERM, typically the worse the visual symptoms, but more important, post-operative outcomes are not as good with stage three and stage four ERMs as was shown in this study by Dr. Isagul Mavi Yildiz and colleagues, which was published in I in 2021. Now, while vision improvements can be seen in all stages of epiretinal membranes, the gains in stage three and stage uh, four epiretinal membranes are not as great. And this might be an argument to either intervene uh, at an earlier stage uh, than stage three or to intervene once a patient begins to develop a stage three or greater ERM. Now, these findings were corroborated in our study by lead author Mustafa Mafi, who also found that improvement in ectopial, ectopic interfoveal layer thickness correlates with better visual outcomes. A good sign, actually, when we're looking at the early postoperative OCT for the patient presented in today's video. Now, some other biomarkers to look out for include the cotton ball sign, which is a hyperreflective focus that can be seen uh, in the outer retina at the fovea, and that's shown in the upper image here, as well as intraretinal fluid, uh, which is shown in the bottom image. And both of these can be associated with worse visual symptoms and maybe markers that one can use to decide whether or not to intervene for an epiretinal membrane. Now, last, the OCT can be helpful for surgical planning. Elevations in the ERM and OCT can help the surgeon to identify a safe spot to initiate the ERM peeling. And it's also worth noting that areas of RNFL schesis should generally be uh, avoided for initiating a peel because that can uh, further exacerbate damage to uh, the, the nerve fiber layer.
Now, there are a number of adjuvants that can be used to aid in visualization of uh, epiretinal membranes during peeling. Uh, in this case, Dr. Chakir showed us the use of dilute tramcinolone, was, which isn't exactly a stain, but the, the settling of the crystals on uh, the ERM and on the, uh, on, the, on the macular surface can aid in depth perception and can aid in identifying areas where the ERM uh, has been peeled and conversely where the ERM is still present. Now, tissue blue or ICG can also be used, although these dyes stain the ILM and therefore provide a negative stain uh, for the ERM that is, of course, superficial to the ILM. Now, when elevating membranes, Dr. Shakir showed us the pinch and peel technique whereby the ERM is grasped with the ILM forceps perpendicular to the retinal surface. Now, ideally during the first pinch, the tissue should be gently elevated and rocked laterally to loosen the ERM from its underlying adhesions. And then that loosened epiretinal membrane can then be regrasped and then peeled uh, in a way that is tangential to the edge of the ERM, and that peeling can be extended circumferentially. Now, some ERMs can be tightly adherent, and some surgeons prefer the use of a flex loop or a diamond dusted membrane scraper to initiate uh, the ERM peeling, which we showed you in episode 115. Now, when extending the peel, it's important to go slowly and use steady force carefully looking out for excess traction on the inner retina and ensuring that the movement of the forceps doesn't inadvertently make contact with the inner retina. Now, once the peeling is done, some surgeons also prefer to stain and peel the ILM. And while studies have shown that visual outcomes are not different with ILM peeling, this extra step can decrease the risk of recurrent ERM formation. And so the surgeon will have to decide the risk benefit of, of uh, performing this additional step. Now, overall, the, the steps of ERM peeling were beautifully demonstrated by Dr. Chakir in this case. We want to thank him for sharing this case and for giving us all an opportunity to learn more about ERM management. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please visit us at retinarounds.com. There you can sign up for our email list. You'll get a notification every time a new video is posted. And if you have an interesting video or a tip or trick that you'd like to share, please follow the links on our website and you can upload your video there. Thanks so much for watching.